Good morning and welcome to Wednesday's Politics at Jack and Sam's Daily, your digest of everything coming up in the day ahead in British politics in under 20 minutes. It is Wednesday, October the 9th. It is the first Prime Minister's Question Sessions after the conference season and we are all very excited about it. My name is Jack Blanchard of Politico. With me uh, in his kitchen, as always, is Sam Coates of Sky News. And Sam, I am feeling pretty good about British politics. I was just thinking um, this morning, you know, it wasn't very long ago that I was looking at that election result and thinking we're in for a kind of boring few years ahead where not very much was going to happen and we had this enormous majority government doing slightly boring things and here we are just a few weeks later with a prime minister on the rack downing street in chaos a really important and interesting budget being finalized in these next few days a tory leadership contest which is now really exciting and delivering in spades for those of us who like to watch this sort of drama And we've got a US election a few weeks away, which Donald Trump may or may not win. And it just feels like politics is really, really interesting again in a way that I maybe hadn't expected was going to happen by the by early October. Exciting. Yes. Excitement, however, kind of not the vibe that you're getting from many, many MPs at the moment. Spending quite a lot of time in Portcullis House yesterday, uh, talking to them. uh, Nerves. What's the Uh, the vibe? (laughs) What was the vibe you're getting? They're not enjoying um, this. Uh, amongst Labour MPs, they're having to take a big breath. They are surprised that they've ended up where they've ended up, kind of with incoming fire from so many different directions. And they are hoping, hoping the budget and the spending review on October the 30th puts them on track once again. But Jack, I have to say, as somebody very senior in government was saying through gritted teeth, if you put enormous expectations on one event like a budget, it almost inevitably underperforms. So Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer have a huge job against the backdrop of Downing Street turmoil, foreign turmoil, uh, to pull something quite special out of the bag uh, in a little over three weeks, all of which has to be finalised in the next 10 days. Every single Labour MP wants them to do it, but can they is the big question. Anyway, that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. What else? Well, I think we'll we'll split the podcast. The first half, we should talk about what the government is up to because it's PMQs today at noon, as always on Wednesday, and it's not going to be an easy one for Keir Starmer, given what's happened the last few weeks. We need to talk about the budget because today is the day that Rachel Reeves makes her first submission to the Office of Budget Responsibility, and we're starting to see some more concrete headlines now and get some more concrete reporting on what she's likely to do in that budget. Um, and there's lots of other government activities today, as well as David Lammy going to the Middle East, which, of course, is in crisis, and the Renters Reform Bill in the House of Commons as well today. Um, And then we need to talk about the Tories because today is crunch day for uh, at least one of the Tory leadership contenders. Today is the day that the the number of contenders goes down from three to two and we go into the final head-to-head battle and it is absolutely neck and neck um, between at least two of those rivals in that race and uh, and genuinely lots and lots of people have no idea what's going to happen today. So that's going to be exciting as well. Um, Just to talk briefly about PMQs, it's the first PMQs we've had for a few weeks Uh, and it's fair to say those few weeks have not been particularly kind to Keir Starmer Uh, it wasn't that long ago on this podcast that uh, we were sort of suggesting that Rishi Sunak was kind of phoning in it phoning it in a bit as leader of the opposition wasn't turning up really to conference wasn't really bothering at PMQs was just sort of agreeing with Keir Starmer I don't think we'll see that today. He's actually done a pretty good job at PMQs the the last couple of times he did it before the conference break Rishi Sunak and I suspect he's got a real open goal today just because of the so many negative stories around Labour, obviously, over the last few weeks from the Downing Street chaos and the need to reshuffle the senior staff in there all the way through to the ongoing row about winter fuel cuts, the freebie gate and all the rest of it. So I think Keir Starmer will not enjoy the half hour he's got today and will be very much hoping that other news quickly pushes it out of the headlines. I'll be looking at the faces of Labour, of the Labour benches, because uh, I think... After all that talk for months of Keir Starmer having a loyal set of hand-picked Starm troopers uh, in his parliamentary party, um, it's not entirely clear to me that they are as enamoured with them as the kind of reporting once uh, suggested. Um, And uh, I think if we look at what they're looking forward to or kind of anticipating, that is the budget and the spending review on October the 30th. Now, that has now become the moment where this government has to 
sort of really set out the story it's trying to tell. Is this a, is this a government about fixing the NHS and fixing bits of public services? Is it about growth and is it about capital spending? Uh, is it about making sure that Labour can be trusted with the public finances? All of those actually contradict each other. Uh, in some way or another. How does Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer thread that needle? Remarkably this week, I got one person at at, at the centre of government conceding that, you know, for better or for worse, they have left this budget too late. They didn't have a great deal of wiggle room because they needed to give uh, the Office for Budget Responsibility some time to work out its forecasts. But they actually think that the amount of time from election day to now uh, and and to uh, October 30th has, 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 has dragged on too long. Um, and they haven't used that time uh, uh, well. And, and that has made things uh, more difficult. So the whole framing of this, this budget has already uh, started to sort of slip out of their control. Today is an important day um, in in terms of the budget process. If you want to get into the geekery of it, there's a sort of back and forth that happens between the Chancellor and the Office for Budget Responsibility, the OBR, the watchdog um, that, that keeps an eye on the public finances or in every case apart from these trusses when of course it was excluded from doing so. Today the Chancellor submits her main measures that she's planning to do to the OBR so that they can make an assessment of the financial impact they will have and then they send that impact back and then she adds in more measures and there's this sort of back and forth between the Treasury and the OBR which goes on for a few weeks up to Budget Day. The expectation now is that Rachel Reeves is indeed going to press ahead with a tweak to the rules around debt that will allow her to suddenly magically find billions of pounds more, we don't know how many billions of pounds more, of investment into capital investment into big projects to announce. And it is just amazing to me how chancellors can always seem to do this when they're in trouble. You just sort of fiddle the accounting a little bit and say, oh, actually, we're going to count this as that, and we're going to count that as this. And that means, hey, presto, here's some more money to spend. The big danger, I think, for Rachel Reeves, or the thing that some people are worried about, is if she does this, does it have any impact on Britain's borrowing costs? Uh, in a sort of, do we get into a sort of Liz Trust world of borrowing more money and 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 and, and causing financial problems for the economy? And that's the sort of tightrope that Rachel Reeves is going to be walking. But it seems that I mean, there's a pretty authoritative report in the Guardian on the front page this morning saying she told the cabinet on Tuesday she is going to do this in some form. Uh, My colleague Dan Bloom writing Playbook says that's on the money and therefore the, the, the question now is how much of this investment are we going to see and exactly what tweaks to these rather obscure but very important debt rules will she go through with to find that cash? Government officials, advisors have been doing a very good job since early September of signalling that this is coming. They were pretty blunt that this was on the cards right back to early September when I was talking to them. So it's no surprise that we've got here. But it is a surprise that it's happening because there are two big challenges here if Rachel Reeves changes uh, the way that debt is defined, which allows her to, within the fiscal rules she promised in the manifesto, uh, borrow more. Um, The first Jack, and this is an underappreciated, but I think it's a massive point. Rachel Reeves, last November, promised she wouldn't do exactly this. Last November, she said, uh, she told reporters, we are not going to fiddle the figures or make something to get different results when asked whether or not she would consider using the easier debt target. We will use the same models the government uses, right? Black and white absolutely clear a chancellor a shadow chancellor giving her word now a year on looking like she's going to break that word now for all the pitch rolling in the world if you have a promise at one stage that is broken a year later that raises the question when it comes to things the markets need to trust you on can they have faith in what you say i think that is a big problem it is a problem that is written about on bloomberg but it is it strikes me as a bigger problem than that because confidence in the markets is a fickle and unscientific and almost emotional thing as Liz Truss found out to her cost. And if this government starts to find that borrowing weight, uh, rate, for instance, on uh, uh, the 10-year gilt price, the amount that um, uh, it costs to borrow for this government go up and people's mortgages go up, this government will face the same accusations that the uh, uh, that Liz Truss's government had uh, and it would become f- effectively a parody. Massive, massive jeopardy here. However, 
Despite that report on the front of the Financial Times, I'm not sure we are anywhere near that at the moment. So there is a bit of space. I was talking to Ed Conway, Sky's data and economics editor yesterday, and we were looking at the kind of cost of debt. Now, the cost of debt has gone up and it's pretty much gone up since Labour conference, right? And that was the moment where Rachel Reeve said, look, I'm going to, I, I, I am going to invest. I am going to basically borrow to invest more in this budget. However, he points out that it's gone up in exactly the same way in America, which is one indicator that the markets aren't nervous yet. And the other thing is that there is a other ed- economic indicator called credit default swaps that measures kind of the riskiness uh, of government debt because it's an insurance against it defaulting. Uh, and that has gone right down. So at the moment, the markets are sanguine, but it does, as, it, as you say, depend on what measure, and what change and what tweak and how much extra borrowing she can do but she really is playing with fire at this, given what she previously said. The Guardian sets out two options for Rachel Rees to change the debt measure, one far more radical than the other, um, in which you you account for the value of the assets the government holds, like roads and schools and hospitals. And if you measure their net worth, they reckon you could find an extra 50 billion quid uh, to chuck at investment. There's a less radical option where you uh, you keep those debt rules in place, but you exclude losses from the Bank of England. That would free up more like 10 to 20 billion pounds. Um, th- th- they're very big, different options. The the more radical one would seem to be more likely to trigger the sort of market panic, or maybe panic's a bit strong, but you know, send up those borrowing costs higher than the less radical one. These are the options Rachel Reeves has been weighing up. We are expecting her to make a decision and and send her, her budget plan to the OBR today. It seems unlikely to me that we will get all the way to the budget without a journalist finding out exactly which of those she's planning to do. So I think um, there will be more on this uh, in the days ahead. What would you spend that investment on? Very interesting to hear Louise Hay, the Transport Secretary, talking about HS2 yesterday when she was out on her morning broadcast round. And there seems to be a suggestion that it might be that HS2 could be back on the agenda, at least in some form. The way the government has left that scheme after cutting the northern half of it doesn't really work very well. It causes other transport pro- transport problems on the network. And it might be that a reinvestment in HS2, or at least part of that scheme, could be one of the things uh, that the Treasury is weighing up or that the Chancellor is weighing up in terms of how you spend these extra, in- extra investment billions. All of this a world away from Rachel Reeves' July 22nd statement where she unveiled the £22 billion black hole, scrapped some capital investment projects like the road down to Cornwall, uh, and suddenly set herself up a huge hurdle which she has to fill, this massive black hole, uh, in order to blame the Tories and say that and point to their economic mismanagement. Now we're talking about borrowing more to invest. Uh, the messaging really, lots of people inside government uh, can see is now confusing. But should we pivot to the Tories? Because today's the day that we get down to the final two contenders in the Tory leadership uh, contest. I keep calling them contenders like this is a game show. It really has felt like that uh, with the briefing, the backbiting, uh, uh, the public performances, uh, the diary room-esque social media videos and all the rest of it. Um, So yesterday there was a big upset. uh, And that upset was that James Cleverly leapfrogged his rivals into first place. He put on 18 uh, MP votes out of the 120 of 121 that voted, uh, and uh, is now uh, clearly in the lead in this contest amongst MPs. And Tom Tugendhat was uh, ejected uh, from the uh, Tory Big Brother house, uh, getting the lowest number by quite some margin. Um, ironically, polling later in the day suggested that amongst the public, the Tory M- MPs had just ejected the most popular, or at least the least unpopular, uh, of the four contenders of that race. Um, But even though James Cleverley is clearly ahead amongst MPs, I couldn't tell you, Jack, who's going to win because the polling for the Tory members is so tight. And I can't tell you even whether it's going to be Kemi Badenoch uh, or Robert Jenrick facing James Cleverley in that final two. And that last question is the big one that is going to be decided today. James Cleverley is out in front with 39 votes um, as a sort of the remaining one nation. That's the moderate Tory candidate, he is certain to pick up some of Tom Tugendhat's votes because Tom Tugendhat very much from that wing of the party as well. And therefore, James Cleverley looks undoubtedly like he's going through to me. The big question is, is he going to be facing off against Robert Jenrick and Kemi Badenoch, who are pretty much tied on 31 and 31 votes respectively? 
who is going to win out of those two? It is a real fight to the death for them two now, and there's been absolutely no love lost between them already during this contest. Robert Jenrick and Kemi Badenoch, and the briefing walls between those two last night were going into overdrive. They are both scrambling for those Tom Duggan-hat votes, essentially to get one or other of them over the line into a head-to-head -head with James Cleverley, and that will play out over the next few weeks. And I have no idea which one of them is going to get it. I mean, Kemi Badenoch went into this contest as the sort of darling of the Tory right and the, and the thinking and definitely my thinking was that if she could get enough MP backers to get into the final two she would win now if you, it, now whether that's still true remains to be seen because this contest has you know has changed people's minds and we saw that at Tory conference but she is still definitely popular amongst Tory members. So if you're a right wing conservative now and you're looking at this James Cleverly surge and you don't want James Cleverly to be the Tory leader, might it be wise to start throwing your money on, on, on Kemi Baynock at this point as the, the person most likely to stop him from winning? I mean, it feels like Robert Jenrick has lost a lot of momentum over the last week or two. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Kemi just sneaking through now as the sort of right wing try and try and um, convalesce around one figure who can stop James Cleverly, who's very much now the front runner. But honestly, the history of these contests, Sam, just shows how difficult it is to predict. You know, it, that it, re it really is very, very hard to know where these votes are going to go. And I was reminded of the drama of last time we were in this position. Do you remember when um, three became two, when it ended up with Trust versus Rishi Sunak and uh, and Penny Mordaunt was so close to getting into that final two and just a couple of three or four MP votes going the other way would have put her in against Rishi Sunak and the whole Liz Trust debacle would never have happened and so like it's very very hard to, to predict where just a handful of votes either way can completely change the course of these contests. Um, in 2022 when that happened and Liz Truss faced off uh, Rishi Sunak. Uh, it was always claimed that Rishi Sunak had lent some votes to Liz Truss to try and stop Penny Morden because he thought that she was the bigger threat. But look how that turned out. Um, could that happen again? Could James Cleverley, who's so far out in front, now lend some votes to uh, perhaps Robert Jenrick, who the polling, the Sky polling from last week suggests is a little bit closer to, to him in, in the race? Well, uh, on the record, allies absolutely deny that, but uh, uh, you always have to take those denials uh, with a with a pinch of salt. And those tactics have gone uh, uh, wrong in the past, although they have worked in the past. Um, Ian Duncan Smith admitted to Sky News, a lovely piece by John Craig last night, that when he won in 2001, some of his supporters voted for Ken Clark precisely to knock out Michael Portillo back then, who was the favourite. Um, but both camps fighting for that second spot face challenges. As you say, Kemi Badenoch is telling people and their the campaign is, is issuing statements saying they want the right to unite around her. Yet the votes that are up for grabs, the Tugan Hat votes, they're largely, not entirely, but largely one nationers. So um, that's a problem. And, and, and there is a bit of unforgiving dislike of Kemi amongst parts of the right. She lost some of her shine when she was in the government, Rishi Sunak's government, because of the fight that she did, she's perceived not to have had to get rid of EU law. You might remember they promised to get all the EU, EU law off the statute books. She didn't do it. She got the blame. Some people are still talking about that and mentioning that even now. But then there's Robert Jenrick. He went backwards. He went backwards by two MP votes and he underperformed compared to the kind of expectations set by his own team yesterday morning. I was being told yesterday morning, Jenrick would get 35 to 40 votes. He got 31. If you're losing momentum, are you going to be able to scoop up votes? Those are the reasons why this is so hard to call. 3.30 is the result. We're all going to be tuned in. It's worth thinking about where Labour's head is at on this. And most of the Labour people I speak to don't want James Cleverly to win because they see him as the most, in his own words, normal candidate and the one most likely to put the Tories towards the centre ground where Labour think you know any this current Labour operation think any party is most likely to win from. They are quite op optimistic about the prospect of facing Kemi Bade, not because they think she would essentially blow herself up. Um, and they think Robert Jenrick would be seen through by the electric as disingenuous and lacking in charisma, with one person was saying it to me. So maybe there's some sense in James Cleverly being out in front, but Tory members are unlikely to be making those sorts of calculations, frankly, when they're making this final decision. Um, and there's a long way to go yet. And that is 
Sam's 20 alarm. minute alarm off. We have to stop. Oh my God, we're out of time. Well, uh, all right. Well, we got to the end of it. Um, we will be back with you tomorrow when we will know who's in the final two. Uh, we will uh, speak to you then. I can't wait to find out. All right, Sam, have a lovely day. Enjoy it. I will see you on Thursday. 